Coming up on DTNS, Tom thinks he might have spotted the next Google. Tom's me. How much money do small U.S. carriers need to get rid of Huawei and ZTE equipment? And Patrick Norton's here to review the high points of the big hardware announcements from me. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, September 4th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Len Peralta. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And joining us, Patrick Norton, host of AVXL, is back. Good to have you, man. Good to be here. Sarah Thanks. Lane has the day off, well-deserved day off, uh, but we're going to be talking about uh, some of the EFA stuff. we got some AI stories, and uh, we were just talking about you know, everybody's deal with schools and however different areas of the country are dealing with that on Good Day Internet. Uh, if you want that and some discussions of all kinds of other good stuff, go become a member, patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Gamers in Africa may experience lower lag when playing online if their ISPs are connected to the Angola Cables Network. Angola Cable used data collected from traffic routing during the lockdowns, when there was a lot of people playing games, to develop an IT transit system that they say reduces latency or lag by 20 to 50 percent for gamers in Africa and elsewhere in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, ping was reduced between 70 and 100 milliseconds, not two, but by 70 and 100 milliseconds during a demonstration event between gamers in South America and Africa. Russian search company Yandex will spin out its self-driving unit from MLUBV, which is a joint venture with Uber. After that spin out, Uber will own 19% with Yandex and its subsidiaries having the rest. Self-driving car unit currently has a testing fleet of 130 vehicles spread across Russia, Israel, and the United States. Speaking of Uber, Uber announced it will add an Uber rent option to its mobile app in the UK. Users will be able to make a booking just before picking up the vehicle, although Uber is actually encouraging them to make a reservation at least 24 hours in advance. Uh, Uber has trialed similar services in Australia and France. Japan's antitrust regulator will take a closer look at Apple's App Store policies for any potential violations. Bloomberg sources say several Japanese game studios have expressed concern not so much about the 30% cut, but about the App Store, including inconsistent enforcement guidelines, unpredictable content decision, and lapses in communication. Uh, that seems to be... The thing, yeah, that, that seems to be the thing you definitely hear everyone agree on, even if they are not upset about the 30% cut. And a couple of EFA announcements from Huawei. The Honor Magic Book 14 and 15 laptops were announced. They'll have AMD's Ryzen 5 4500U CPUs inside. Magic Book 14 out September 21st, starting at 749 euros and 99 cents, and the Magic Book 15 in October for 699 euros 99 cents. The 16-inch MacBook Pro, I'm sorry, I, the, that's what they want you to say. Magic Book Pro has AMD's Ryzen 5 4600H CPU. That one's coming September 7th for 899 euros 99. And Huawei announced two Honor branded smartwatches. The ruggedized Watch GS Pro is said to meet US mill standard 810G procurement standards for withstanding extreme temps, humidity, rain, sand, and pressure. I doubt the US military will be buying any of them, but it meets the standard. <laughs> uh, it also offers a root back mode uh, that'll either use GPS or GLONASS uh, to help you retrace your steps if you're you know, out hiking around. So it's kind of meant for outdoorsy stuff. Battery life is 100 hours in workout mode or 48 hours with GPS. That one's available September 7th for 249 euros 99. And the more stylish, typical Honor Watch ES has a 10-day battery life. Ooh, uh, kind of a fitness tracker thing. Ship in September 7th for a mere 99 euros 99 cents. All right, let's talk a little bit about a Facebook disclosure policy. Facebook has had a disclosure policy. Well, they've had a disclosure system, let's say, for a while, uh, but they never codified the policy. Now they have got an official policy on third-party vulnerability disclosure. Uh, under the new policy, Facebook says that when its researchers find critical bugs or security vulnerabilities in third-party software, this isn't dog fooding, that's a whole different thing. This is, we were using software in making Facebook and running Facebook and we found a vulnerability. Facebook will give developers 21 days to respond and 90 days to fix the issues, pretty standard. Company says it will make good faith efforts to report the bugs appropriately to third parties, but reserves the right to disclose sooner if a vulnerability is being actively exploited 
or even delay beyond the 90 days if everyone agrees there needs to be more time to fix it. Facebook says it will also disclose its own patched vulnerabilities. Uh, and in fact, in pursuant of that, the company published details on six WhatsApp vulnerabilities. None of those showed evidence of being exploited and all of those have been fixed. Uh, and WhatsApp now has a little dedicated area for this if they disclose any vulnerabilities in the future. But Patrick, I don't know about you, it strikes me as a pretty standard vulnerability disclosure plan. People seem to be generally pleased with it. I, I, I keep feeling like, wow, this seems, you know, enormously normal. I wonder if they'll actually live up to the simple and fairly low bar they've set for themselves. Well, yeah, I mean, um, because it's Facebook, you you think right. advertising, but this isn't the advertising side. This is the uh, the, the security researcher side of right. Facebook. No, no, no. I just, I mean, literally, it's, 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 it all seems reasonable and smart and intelligent, and, and I, I just, I, I, I'm so burnt out on Facebook saying things and then forgetting what they said in terms of yeah. policy. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess the reason I, I brought up that it's a different wing <laughs> is that you know Facebook yeah. is more than one person, so hopefully you're right. Uh, that this group uh, is like, no, no, we're security researchers. Uh, we 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 follow you know the the norms uh, of the industry, and and this is a good example. Uh, this is a good precedent for that to say like, oh no, your security, yeah. the third party vulnerability policy looks pretty good, pretty standard. And all of the folks that I've read reacting to it, you know, they may have a quibble here or a quibble there in, in minor stuff, but uh, Facebook has a bug bounty program that's that's fairly unremarkable or uncontroversial. So hopefully- I would is. like to apologize to the entire Facebook security <laughs> community for any offense they might have taken. Uh, I'll just leave and, it there. <laughs> until later when, <laughs> when they screw it up. No, they're not going to screw it up. We believe in you. All yeah, right. A, uh, a report from the U.S. Federal Communications Commission estimates the cost of removing Huawei and ZTE equipment from small telecommunications networks in the U.S. will be $1.8 billion. In other words, to be able to figure out how to rip that all out and replace it, $1.8 billion. Now, about $1.6 billion of that would qualify for federal reimbursement if the U.S. Congress appropriates the funds, which they have not yet done. The report <laughs> only covers carriers that receive universal service funds provided to subsidize coverage in underserved areas. So the real overall cost in the U.S. of ripping out Huawei and ZT equipment is likely larger. In a related write-up, uh, at least it seems related to me, Wired Stephen Levy has a great interview with Qualcomm's founder, Erwin Jacobs, uh, that sheds light on the rise of Huawei and ZTE. Jacobs notes that Qualcomm could have been like Huawei, where they were making chips and making handsets right. and you know making other equipment, but wanted to get carriers to adopt CDMA as a standard. And back then in the 90s, getting the carriers saw a handset maker as a competitor. So Qualcomm backed out of making handsets. They had only ever made them in, guess where, Asia. They thought other U.S. companies would kind of pick up the baton, but Motorola and others didn't. They left that business, uh, leaving Qualcomm's chipsets, which were still available for sale because that's that was what they built their business mm -hmm. on, as an easy way for Chinese companies like Huawei and ZTE to fill the gap. Huawei and ZTE also, Jacobs points out, benefited from the Chinese government funding their research and development, something that U.S. companies did not get from the U.S. government. I, I do you? I mean, does does the 1.6, 1.8 billion dollars? Does that seem kind of low for unknitting this, or just is that just because it's so restricted? It, yeah, it does until you think about like, oh, this is only USF, right? This is right. the the FCC saying, okay, the people who would qualify for reimbursement qualify because we give them money to build out. So we'll give them money to replace and it's only those folks who qualify. And you're you're also talking about small carriers, you know, the uh, folks who who live in big cities probably don't even run into these carriers, but they're they're usually in rural areas. Sometimes they're in other underserved areas, uh, you know, like 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 poor areas, uh, stuff like that, but but they're small. Uh, that That's kind of the point. The, the AT&Ts right. and the Verizons, uh, they have their own capital budgets and they're not trying to, well, maybe they, they may be trying, but they, <laughs> I don't think they're gonna get any money from this. You're laughing because I, I said they would be trying and I'm not sure. <laughs> yes. but yeah, but that's not really the, the point here. This is- I'm trying not this, to oversaturate uh, DTNS <laughs> with snark. So I was trying to pull myself back from the abyss there. <laughs>
But yeah, uh, so I thought that was interesting too. Just, you know, the idea that that's a lot of money to spend uh, to rip out equipment that may have an issue. Uh, you know, the, there's a lot of suspicion. There's there's not a lot of hard evidence uh, that there's an issue, but some people feel the suspicion is all you need. Uh, and that's a couple billion dollars that has to be spent in order to get it out. It's been interesting to watch that whole, you know, is there proof? Is there not proof? You know, different agencies say they've seen proof, but um, it all remains very, very thin. We never got the follow up on the Bloomberg Business Week story, did we? That's the only time anybody said they had found evidence and everyone denied it, uh, except for <laughs> Bloomberg Business Week. Uh, so that was uh, we're still, yeah, I haven't forgotten, folks. Still waiting to see if Business Week will ever clarify that story. They haven't yet. As far as I know. Uh, we talked with Andrew Main back in July about OpenAI's GPT-3 and what it can do to produce natural sounding text. Remember, Andrew had created a, a system for mimicking the voice of historical figures or anybody, including myself, that you could find text from. One problem with GPT-3, though, is while it can sound convincingly human, it isn't good at accuracy. Technology Review has a write-up about a company called Diffbot. Pay attention to this company. Diffbot right now takes text and creates a series of three-part factoids that relate one thing to another. So, for example, if they looked at your bio, they would say, Patrick Norton is a writer, you know, subject, verb, object. Patrick Norton lives in St. Louis. Those factoids are all connected in a giant knowledge graph, and Diffbot's knowledge graph is huge. Diffbot, Google, and Microsoft are the only three U.S. companies that crawl the entire public web. They don't target, Whoa. they crawl everything. Uh, Diffbot uses some neuro-linguistic processing then to extract factoids from the entire public web and then adds them to its knowledge graph. It rebuilds its graph every four to five days, adding, they say, on average, 100 to 150 million new entities each month and use machine learning to create new connections and get rid of out-of-date ones. So it's constantly trying to stay up to date. DiffBot's knowledge graph is available free to researchers, but it also has 400 paying customers. And those paying customers you may have heard of. DuckDuckGo, for instance, <laughs> Snapchat, NASDAQ, all pay for access to this knowledge graph. Uh, in fact, Adidas and Nike use it particularly to search for counterfeit shoes. Because you can go search for Adidas and Nike, but if you want to say, look, I just want to find the people that are actually selling shoes, Diffbot is good at that. It can say, okay, we'll return only the people who are actually trying to sell your shoes, and it even maybe give you a tip off on which ones are legit and which ones aren't. Diffbot CEO Mike Tung says he plans to create a natural language interface to Diffbot. Right now you have to do some coding if you want to access it, but if you had that natural language interface, he wants to create a universal factoid question answering system where you could ask it any question and it would not only answer accurately, but cite its sources. Uh, OpenAI's librarian of the internet. And uh, OpenAI's <laughs> GPT-3 might play a part in creating that front end because Diffbot isn't good at the natural language part and OpenAI GPT-3 is. This struck me as, I'm not saying it is the next Google, but if there were to be the next Google, this is how I would kind of see it playing out, which is we're not going to be advertising based. So we don't have that part. We, we, we make our money elsewise and we can create a, a system that will just answer your question accurately without giving you a bunch of spam. I can think of nothing that would make me happier. Um, I'm also kind of like, cause you said there was, you know, the scale of the amount of, 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 you know, search they're doing is so huge. And, They've had $13 million in funding. They have 16 members, according to Crunchbase, and they actually have a business model, um, which I think suggests an entire law on sort of the scale of venture capital investment versus practical nature of companies that I'm not qualified to make. But, <laughs> Certainly, you know, I'm sure. Uh, you know, and, and, and these folks came out of Stanford. Uh, so, you know, very similar story of like smart folks at Stanford figured out a new algorithm and then built a business on it, right? Sounds yeah. familiar. Yeah. It's pretty impressive. Uh, you know, don't if Diffbot never turns into anything, uh, don't, you know, I mean, you can taunt me all you want. It's fine. I'm, I'm not guaranteeing anything here, but I definitely think this is something to keep an eye on.
Uh, if you want to, if if you want to be able to later say, oh yeah, I heard about Diffbot way back in 2020 on DTNS. Tom Merritt told me about it on DTNS. <laughs> you should subscribe. Google Magenta is a Google AI project that makes AI-based tools to help the creative process. So you may have heard them. Uh, they can help you compose melodies uh, or help you draw cats because every AI <laughs> thing has to start with cats somewhere. Uh, now Google Magenta has a tool to help you make lo-fi vibes to calm you down during stressful times. Uh, this was a project spearheaded by an intern, Vibert Teo. He created a lo-fi player, which lets you interact with objects in a web-based eight bit room. So it's got eight bit graphics, looks kind of retro and you mix your own soundtrack. Now, Tio used human made bass lines, drum beats, et cetera. He also wrote four melody options. That was the bass. But then machine learning kicks in and riffs off those melodies. So every time you log in, you get a different one, right? It's taking the melody that was human made and, and changing it somehow. And then the fun of it is you can just sort of click around in there and uh, you know add in a bass line, change the beats per minute. Uh, and there's a couple of cool things in here where you like click on the TV in the room and the machine can interpolate between say the chill and the dense melody. Uh, you can click on a guitar on the wall and you can add that. You can add a bass line by clicking on the bass, click on the piano, add a piano. Uh, there's also a YouTube channel where you can type commands in chat to change the music along with the rest of the room. It, it's it's a fun demo toy, uh, but it's it's an interesting example of being able to take the sort of machine learning stuff that's out there and 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 create something with humans involved it's also incredibly compelling you like the uh you like the one i got here <laughs> i'm gonna up the i'm gonna add a drum let's see what happens thank you for holding <laughs> oh <laughs> Your call is very important to us. I don't know. What do you think about this? Is it is it just, I mean, it's just a fun tool for machine learning, or is there anything more to it? I, I think anything. It, it, one, I, I, I'm a sucker for anything like that allows me to tap four times and create an entirely different melody uh, or beat or track. Um, I'm, you know, I, I actually want to go to the YouTube channel and start experimenting with the commands you can type in. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a limit on what it can do so you can't really mess yeah. with it too much i think that's why it was safe to put, <laughs> to put into a youtube channel like that but but yeah if you're into a little lo-fi music you can click on the cat and change the the background sound from rain to a beach or change the cat to a dog and then you get cityscape sounds you know it's kind of fun go check it out magenta.github.io slash lo-fi dash player uh, or we'll have it in the uh, show notes at dailytechnewsshow.com Hey, folks, if you want to, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just going to use this. Uh, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. All right, we've touched on a lot of hardware announcements out of IFA in Berlin this week. And now that we've had a few days to kind of digest them all, Patrick, uh, help us break down some of the important takeaways. I feel like the biggest uh the the biggest stories this week uh were sort of ifa adjacent rather or ifa timed rather than uh -huh. actually at IFA. absolutely yeah uh i think the biggest one for me was of course the 11th gen tiger lake cpu well i'll be honest with you it's a toss-up between nvidia's uh announcement of the 3000 series gpus and sure. the 11th gen tiger lake cpus um but i'll start with intel because it, it this announcement makes me feel like intel isn't quite uh, on its back foot and gra you know gasping for breath as much as it's felt uh, with the processor announcements uh, through this year. Um, AMD was the first to PCI Express 4 on the desktop. Intel beat them to laptops. Um, early benchmarks for these processors are kind of hopeful. Uh, we have not seen any real world benchmarks at this point. Um, it updated 10 uh, nanometer superfin transistor technology, which is basically saying more better process uh, is bringing higher frequencies, which is helping with performance. Um, you know, there's like 50 or so laptops from the Novo Dell, Acer, MSI, um, several others that are going to be uh, hitting between now and the holidays. Uh, I really want to see what the battery life looks like uh, because they're talking about like a 20% improvement or, or sort of a, a 20, not, not a 20% not a improvement in battery life, but that uh, there is some significant uh, 
uh, well, progress, I'll say, in power consumption in various parts. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. if I try to get any deeper than that, I'll, I'll get it wrong. But um, the Evo certification, I think, is really interesting. Uh, it's uh, uh, demanding nine plus hours of real world battery life, uh, fast charging, as in uh, 30 minutes of charging to get four hours of use out of the laptop, which is you've, if you've ever wanted to charge a laptop in between stops on flights on a plane or, mm -hmm. you know, if you're constantly running around, that's a big deal. Um, Wi-Fi 6, which I don't, you know, Wi-Fi 6, I think, is less compelling than we thought it would be. And it's more future-proofing at this point than, any, than anything, really. Yeah, Yeah. the, the real-world improvements, I don't think, are really showing up a lot for home or small business networks. Um, it's early yet. Um, NVIDIA, again, technically wasn't an IFA, but everyone I know that's a gamer with uh, any kind of money is freaking out over the uh, 3070, 3080, and 3090. Yeah, and, no, I think I think you were bold picking Intel in front of Nvidia because this is the because Intel is more of a like oh okay that wasn't a bad announcement everybody's yeah. freaking out about the 3090 I know yeah the and the 3090 is you know a ridiculous ridiculous card it is essentially a um, it's essentially a Titan right they're just calling it a 3090 some people have said the 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 3070 or the 3080s and 3070 um, I don't want to kind of get into a lot of the the product positioning i just as i said to a friend of mine yesterday i'm like whatever you buy there will be several more models sometime next year mm -hmm. that will be delivering more performance for the same prices now or you know the same performance now for less money because uh you know nvidia especially always seems to fit every single price point in the stack um and they they develop more and more cards it's a little maddening actually when you start looking at sort of all of the different options you have uh, available um but uh, you know, you know, there are so many CUDA cores available, uh, especially in the 39. You're like in excess of 10,000, which is an insane number. Um, you know, and everybody that reviews GPUs was kind of like, oh, they did that thing where they make the new GPUs sound amazing with really weird benchmark chart decisions. Um, you know, but fundamentally, these should be vastly. Uh, they, these should deliver vast improvements in performance, especially on RTX, we hope. Again, they haven't given anyone any cards to test, so they're kind of doing a thing that NVIDIA does, which is announcing the cards, getting as many people to buy them as possible, and then we'll see what the performance is. I think they worked really hard after, I think, RTX was kind of underwhelming in real use, so they were trying mm -hmm. to, to make some really serious efforts that the 3000 series, they kind of sat on this for a long time, uh, and... They want to make this sure the feels like when ray tracing is finally that. worth having in there, right? Like they had to I do it earlier so. to lay the groundwork, and and this feels like the time it'll maybe pay off. Yeah, I mean, as 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 you put it in one of the notes in the script, watch the GeForce RTX 3080 get medieval on an <laughs> RTX 2080 Ti and Doom Eternal. That was um, PC World's headline, not mine. I'm so sorry. <laughs> My apologies, PC World. Um, you know. This is, uh, I also, for the first time uh, in years, I actually wish I'd bought a larger power supply uh, for my main desktop box. One, because power supplies are still kind of erratic in terms of the ability to buy a decent, high-quality power supply right now. Um, but the 3080 is looking for 320 watts. The 3090 is like 350 watts. Uh, the 3070 is a mere 220 watts. Um, you know, uh, by the way, uh, rumors are already hitting, uh, or actually Tweak Town, I should say, is, is, uh, is reporting that supplies will be incredibly thin on these cards until next year. Just which, because people want them? Is that why? You know, I'll just, I'll say go to Tweak Town to learn more. I think mm -hmm. it's fair to drive the traffic their direction. Um, yeah. But it's, it, but that's also kind of a classic situation with almost any GPU launch uh, in recent memory. Um, there's also been some interesting things where, uh, you know, the, the 2000 series cards have mostly vaporized uh, from the channel. And there's also some sort of uh, coin mining activity that is particularly compelling to use uh, GPUs for that is starting to drive GPU man, uh, demands again. Man, I thought we, I thought they'd all moved to ASICs. So uh, it, it, I'm sorry. ASICs are no longer as, a, according to a friend who is is mm -hmm. deep in the the mining lifestyle. Uh, you know, he had actually gotten rid of, uh, he had actually disassembled all of his systems with their umpteen GPUs per box uh, because ASICs, he couldn't compete with ASICs. And now the algorithm seems to have switched in a way that mm -hmm. makes the GPUs much more competitive uh, for mining or, you know, profitable 
at this point. Um, Qualcomm had a bunch of announcements that I, I think were kind of interesting to look at uh, because, you know, kind of extending on that story earlier where they were like, well, we were doing this, but we made this decision. And now Qualcomm's kind of like, okay, we need, uh, you know, we need lots and lots of revenue because it's that time of the year again. Uh, everybody wants revenue. Um, you know, the next uh, Snapdragon 4 is essentially going to bring 5G to inexpensive phones to the mass market. Um, the Snapdragon 8CX Gen 2.5G, which um, is ARM for Windows laptops, um, and they're claiming better than 10th Core i5 performance for like half the watts. So if uh, you know a Core i, a 10th Gen Core i5 is pulling 14 watts, they're claiming they deliver comparable performance at seven watts. Mm. Uh, you know, the other part they talked about was their uh, adaptive noise cancellation for true wireless earbuds. A lot of earbuds, uh, a lot of uh, wireless earbuds or true wireless earbuds are using Qualcomm uh, chips as part of the uh, device. My beloved Cambridge Audio Melomania, one of the first I knew of that actually used it. The performance is excellent. Um, and this is bringing some really slick Apple AirPod Pro grade active noise cancellation. So with the idea is that they will, as your, your, your earbuds shift around in your ears or maybe contact changes, they will actually adapt the noise cancellation. Um, but they will probably do it for a lot less money. And mm -hmm. uh, I think it's interesting to watch all of these developments on Qualcomm and, you know, Qualcomm kind of moving away from just being like, we make phones because of course there are, you know, there are so many competitors. Apple of course has their own in-house processing, mm -hmm. but to see them kind of really trying to create an ARM, a Windows ARM processor that can really pound on Intel is an interesting move for them to make. Very uh, curious to see real world performance. Yeah, f fi finally, let, let, let's uh, finish with thoughts on on just the, the broader question of, IFA having some in person, but really yeah. it was minimal. Uh, and and this was the the you know the first of the huge tech conferences that was consumed majority online. It's been interesting to look at because uh, you know it, this it, I, I it feels like IFA will probably be much closer. You know, in 2021, will be much closer to a traditional IFA. Uh, they basically cut down the number of invitees. They they sort of cut everything down to the bone. Um, and uh, uh, at the event this year, of course, we already know that CES has been canceled. And it was interesting because I it was this very weird moment where I got an email from IFA because I had thought there might be a possibility I could attend IFA uh, in meat space, uh, to use one of my favorite phrases. Mm -hmm. uh, and IFA was basically like, you are no lo you're no longer invited. You're, you're in America. <laughs> you guys have issues and keep your filthy. We're, we're keeping it to, you know, 5000 people tops anyway. Yeah. So sorry. Uh, you know, thank you for your interest. Uh, yeah. Stay in America. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's been interesting to watch because it 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 at this point it seems like they are going to be going back to their sort of full scale operation in 2021. We wait with bated breath. Uh, where you know at the same time this year, you know CES decided to um, go all virtual, and it's been interesting because a lot of what uh, people seem to be hearing is is that a lot of a, a lot of organizations are starting to sort of like okay if we're going to pull away from these events um, then we can start doing our own virtual events how do we do this is there traction we can get I feel like there's in you know in a year we're either going to be kind of right back on to the sort of traditional trade shows that we were used to or the trade shows are, are going to be limping along uh, and becoming a part of the past mm, uh, mm, or yeah and just becoming big uh, streamed press conferences. Uh, well, folks, you got thoughts on that? Join in the conversation in our Discord, which you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Shout out to the patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Carmine Bailey, John and Becky Johnston, and Chris Benito. Len Peralta, uh, you always find a good angle to draw <laughs> on our topics. What have you found for us today? Well, you had mentioned a, a word. You said a word, Tom, um, minimalist. Um, <laughs> about uh, tech events, and that's my take on this. You know, tech events like the tech them tech themselves are getting smaller and uh, minimal. At least this year they are. And uh, this is my take on that. Even going with a very minimalist look um, of just I, this isn't supposed to be Patrick, but he's someone <laughs> sitting at a uh, at a desk uh, <laughs> saying, hmm, "These launch events are getting to be even smaller than the chips." Uh, so, uh, yeah, so this was just something very, very quick uh, and easy and uh, small. And uh, I believe this one is called Everything is Getting Smaller 
And uh, it's uh, available right now on my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Len, or at my online store at lenperalstore.com. Patrick, does this capture the way you're feeling about these events? <laughs> you know, I'll be honest with you. For me, so much of the importance of the events is 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 all of the things you get to do that are not specifically getting the commercial from the vendors, all the communication, all of the, you know, mm -hmm. these sort of behind the scenes conversations that go on. Um, so I, I think it'd probably be more sobbing in my case. <laughs> Add some tears to that drawing. Aww. Well, uh, if you want to see Patrick when he's not crying, where should you go? Uh, AVXL.com is a very, very good place to go. Uh, that's a podcast I host with Robert Heron. We talk about home theater and audio technology. And uh, we're going to start talking about the joys of putting in uh, Atmos uh, height speakers. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you something. You haven't realized you're running out of cable until you start installing four speakers in the ceiling. So much wire. Ceiling so speakers are watching life. you. Go check Atmos it out. Atmos is really kind of obscene, though, in a cool way. <laughs> <laughs> That's AVXL, A-V-E-X-C-E-L, like, like the spreadsheet, AVXL.com. Uh, also, Paolo uh, used the perk uh, that we have for some patrons where they can ask us to record something for them to have us record his ways directions. Uh, so he got me, Roger, and Sarah to all record like in a hundred kilometers, in two hundred kilometers. Uh, well, probably not kilometers. I think they were just meters. But uh, you, you can now use them too. Uh, not only did he he want to use them for himself, but he made them into ways links. Uh, so you could have Sarah telling you uh, where to go in your car or Roger or me. Uh, you can find those <laughs> links at patreon.com slash DTNS. Thank you, Paulo, for making those uh, and uh, letting us share them with the, the rest of the crowd. That was pretty awesome. That's fun. Yeah. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 20.30 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com live. Don't forget, holiday Monday here in the United States, Labor Day. But we'll be back Tuesday with a Frenchman, Patrick Beja. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>